But uh, I mean, very. They, they bring the picture together. So, so good. So let's start with issues, questions to the panelists. We have we have good time. We have a good half an hour to do so. So, who do you, who wants to begin? You want to begin? Uh, can, uh, can you also introduce yourself? So then the panelists. I am Prasad from uh, Amy Foundation and. Uh, uh, we also bring out a magazine called Lisa India, which talks about sustainable agriculture. Uh, one question uh, to Ashish was, uh, I heard somewhere that uh, Confederation of Indian Industry was uh, involved in uh, determining the carbon footprint. Uh, how did it uh, get into it and how do you look at their uh, interest in looking at carbon footprint, that is one. And second thing is, uh, while the industry reflect the government and the civil societies talk of the same vision, almost, when they write the first document, the means and methods change drastically. Unfortunately, while the government reflects totally short-sighted vision and very skewed priorities. Unfortunately, again, you see that the industry has a larger vision, a longer vision. Both are equally dangerous. That's what I feel. And how do you look at it? How do you tackle it? And thirdly, I wanted to place before you the power of the common person. Because it's not going to affect only the tribal population. It's not going to affect AME and uh, uh, CSC alone. It's going to affect everybody who is living on this planet. How do we make co-opt people to feel that they are sitting on a dangerous uh, planet perpetuated by us and by their own colleagues? Some of them, they also become part of it. So how do we tackle this uh, thing? Thanks. <coughs> Sorry. Thanks, Prasad. Yeah, the CII report, uh, mystery, frankly. Um, and what is even mysterious is that the report, not just uh, you know the results that I mentioned, but in fact, in a forward to the report, uh, Mr. Godrej has actually explicitly stated that India's uh, development path is unsustainable. Mm. However, 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 and that's the big one. The prescriptions in the report do not have any bearing to the analysis. So the prescriptions are still more about, you know, how uh, corporations can get into corporate social responsibility, make their operations environmentally, you know, more benign, etc., etc., how the governments need to, you know, tweak things a bit. Basically, it's a mild reforms kind of a thing. There's no fundamental questioning of the path of development or growth in any sense, though the the results and the analysis should actually have been leading to that kind of a conclusion. And in any case, even what they have proposed in that report, as far as I know, they have not done anything about it. So, uh, and just a week back, uh, Mr. Godrej has an interview in, I think, Economic Times or one of them, uh, where he seems to have completely forgotten that report. So, it's all about how the government needs to remove all the barriers to uh, growth and industrialization and investment and so on and so forth, including uh, land land acquisition. The other Godrej. Oh, really? Yeah, the brother. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe they should talk over dinner. Uh, uh, in any case, so that was this. And so I I, uh, I don't know why and how and why they got into that report, but in any case, there's been no uh, action on it. Um, how do you, the second question I didn't quite follow, but if you're saying that industry uh, and civil society have a similar long-term vision and the government has a short-term vision, is that what? Maybe I got the question. When I see the vision statement of uh, UN CCD report. Uh, UN CCD report. It says the same thing, and maybe a civil society says the same thing, but they exactly pursue different um, paths. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. when you look at the, um, I mean, some of the foundations, private foundations, which are talking about sustainable agriculture. They talk the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes the means are same as a civil society, but the ends are different, which they don't articulate. 
Yes, I mean, one of the things is that uh, the people who are creating the problems, uh, I mean, as in like the, the sort of larger macro level issues, uh, are very good at co-opting the language of those who are protesting against them. So that is definitely happening. You can read a whole lot of government reports which sound like NGO reports. You can read a lot of industry reports which sound like, you know, I may have written it or anybody like that. So th that's about co-opting the language. But if you actually, the crucial thing is to look at what is the operational, operative parts of what they're saying or doing. And there is where the huge difference comes up. Because today it would be politically inappropriate for anybody to say that, no, we can sacrifice the environment for development. Nobody will say that anymore. So they will talk about green growth, green economy, inclusive growth, eco, you put eco in front of anything and it becomes automatically whatever. So eco tourism, eco development, eco blah, blah, blah. So, but that's very different from actually changing the kind of behavior and fundamental patterns of, of uh, industrialization and growth, which would lead to the kind of solutions, uh, long-term solutions that we're looking at. So, uh, Rio, take the uh, declaration that just came out of uh, the Rio Plus 20 conference. Yeah, Lovely language, a lot of it. But again, you look at the operative parts, there's virtually nothing there. Uh, if anything, it might actually even be sliding backwards. You know, Sunita was also there. I don't know what your analysis is, but I don't, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think it was an incredible, colossal waste of uh, money there. But the language is all there. It's a, you know, If this document was written 30 years back, one would have said, oh, wow, you know, yeah, path breaking, whatever. So anyway, uh, that's the thing. How do you make people feel concerned? I mean, this is, of course, uh, you know, a huge, huge uh, question and issue. And I think if you're pointing to, say, the middle classes, people like us, it's a really big issue because we're all beginning to feel more and more comfortable in uh, the, the fact that globalization has benefited many of us. There is no doubt about that. I mean, we can get virtually anything on earth now which we earlier had to smuggle in. It's available here. Okay, And many of us have become richer. So, uh, actually creating a sense of concern and then from the concern action amongst the, you know, the 100, 200 million middle class is a very, is, is, is quite a challenge. I think there are two or three things that need to be done amongst many. Uh, one, the consciousness and awareness of what the impacts of our consumption patterns are. Because today, is especially the new generation that's growing up, is actually not even aware of what those impacts are. Where are my products coming from? Where are they going once they, once I throw them out? Yeah. The uh, the uh, if we can take more and more school students and college students to places where the damage is actually taking place, and and it could be even within the city itself. Or for instance, in Pune, all of our garbage is going into a village which is very close by, which the village is now saying, sorry, that's it, enough, no more garbage. We don't want your garbage, you treat it yourself, right? So taking students there and making them aware of what is the impact of their consumption. Is, I think those are the ways in which we can actually get people at least more aware and then concerned and then provide avenues of action through civil society organizations, uh, etc. One will have to do that. And finally, uh, one, I think, very, very, one thing that really does get people is health. So, for instance, the use of pesticides and how it is coming into our foods is something that immediately makes people sit up, especially women, because they, you know. So, uh, that, uh, it does. Unfortunately not. Unfortunately, men are not sensitive about this. No, unfortunately, it's true. No, no, it's true. I'm, I'm admitting it. As a man, I'm admitting it that it's, it's, it's not there. Women are far more sensitive, unfortunately, in this sin. Men are not. So, it's... Yeah, it is a statement of fact. Yeah, here's another man saying it. So anyway, uh, but health issues uh, and how the current environmental crises, things like chemicals, pesticides, etc., are impacting us, again, makes people sit up. I think these are ways in which one can try and reach across to.